sorry, friends and neighbors. It's so good to be here today to share a little bit about my understanding of the importance of nature and place in community. And I want to start with this image because as Shelley talked about those calming breaths, every time I see this picture I took out of a uh, jetliner about to land in Roanoke, it calms me down. And it reminds me of a time not long before I took this picture that I realized that every place I've ever lived has been in or within sight of these mountains. These are the place, this is the place that I know best and many of us think of this as our ancestral or our more recently adopted home. This is where humans we know and love live in the landscape and leave their mark and the landscape in turn shapes our stories that have been and will be told. I believe we've underestimated the extent to which our values and relationships individually and locally can have a global and a future impact. We can and I think we must think about the nature of here in a different and deeper way than we ever have. It literally could change the world. Let's consider this. Southern writer Eudora Welty said this short little pithy phrase, one place understood helps us know all places better. And if you don't remember anything else from what you hear during my few minutes here, remember this short phrase. Understanding and caring locally offers the possibility that we might come to embrace an empathetic reconnection to and sense of genuine stewardship for every other place on the surface of this planet Earth. We've never had a better opportunity, a more urgent need, and we've never had so much incredible recent information about how this planet operates, its systems and its cycles, and how our presence here impacts that. But I'm sorry to say that over the last 50 years, which is the watch of my generation, what we found is that like the economy, Earth's living systems are not too big to fail. And for the most part, we are the agents of her dis-ease. Let's loosely adopt a medical metaphor and imagine the Earth is a patient in the hospital, suffering bruises and lacerations exhaustion and the consequences of chronic stress, particularly just these last few decades. The Earth's condition could be described as guarded. Many of her vital processes are challenged, some are failing, some have failed, and the rest we simply do not know. We've never had a planet this challenged before to know how residual, how resilient she might be in the face of our sheer numbers and in the West from our snowshoe-sized resource footprint. So bear with me as I briefly gloss over two large areas of concern to spend most of our time on the third one, that of broken relationships. How we use human intelligence and technology and the power that's come to us to shape our civilization depends on the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves. Every civilization since the cave painters has had a narrative mythology that is, it's used to say who they were, what they were about, and where they were going. Our story perhaps began with the onset of the vast amount of energy unleashed in the Industrial Revolution that put our energy slaves to work for us. And it has been an action-packed bodice ripper of a story. But I call it the broken story. It's the old story that we must now leave behind because it will not be an accurate map going forward. One of a number of wrong turns from that map has led post-industrial Western world to act as if Humankind and its economy stand somehow apart from and superior to nature and the larger environment. Our heady modern disregard for species or habitats other than our own has been called by the term hubris, overbearing arrogance, the pride that comes before the fall, perhaps. And I think it's certain that humility will need to be an important part of the reformed character 
of the new story we are writing here today. The old story of economy has failed to count the value and the absolute necessity of Earth's ecosystems, irreplaceable and invaluable services and benefits. Because of that neglect, we failed to shape our commerce and our consumption with regard to limits, boundaries, and tipping points that we should not go past, but we already have. Consequently, we're using up and despoiling faster than the planet can replenish or repair. Let's spend the rest of our time talking about broken relationships, but more importantly than that, the corrective measures that we can implement against those broken relationships. You might think of broken relationships as a kind of perceptual loss. Ways of perceiving the world that we no longer have. We've grown deaf and blind and numb to connections that could and should connect us genuinely within nature, place, and community, both our human community and our non-human communities that we live with. Not surprisingly, being deaf and blind has made it hard for us to find our way. But if we fix these broken relationships, we change the broken story. And the new story will see a slow healing come upon our planet's broken health. That's my hope. Let's look briefly at the symptoms before we look at the correctives. The symptoms I call nature deficit disorder, placelessness, and eco-apathy. Nature deficit disorder, how I wish that were my term, but it's not. Richard Louv coined that term in his 2005 book, Last Child in the Woods. He was one of the first and continues to be one of the most articulate and vocal people to hold up the risk our children uh, are at because of their denaturing. The distance between them and unstructured outdoor play, curiosity, and wonder from nature, from which so much wisdom, comfort, and well-being used to come to us and can in the future. Our lost connection to place I call placelessness. It's a symptom of the fact that many of us don't know where home is. We know where we go to sleep at night, but very few of us can say where we are ultimately from. As mobile Americans, not very many of us take much of our identity, our who-ness, from the landscapes of our lives. Eco-apathy is a loss of our connection of our human and creaturely communities. And ecology, you understand, is all about relationships, webs of relationship. Humans have never stopped depending on the continued well-being of our local habitat for our well-being, though we've forgotten that. As we've grown up deaf and blind to our connections to nature and place, we've lost sight of the interconnectedness of our lives to this place, and of this place to this place. It's possible, though, to heal those broken relationships. And I call those corrective measures renaturing, relocalizing, and adopting a personal ecology. We can come back to our senses. We can regain the vision that lets us see our true nature, as well as the opportunities and obligations that fall on us we can, again, know intentional relationships with nature, place, and community. Reconciliation is the term I want to talk about. The prognosis for the future is hopeful. A new story is possible, and it is already underway. It's not a story of machines or corporations or technologies or armies. It's personal, it's local, it's relational, and it's immediately accessible. Applied in time and insufficient dose, they may help restore to us a fellowship, citizenship, and planetary um, creatureship that we're going to need as the crew of the spaceship Earth going forward into the Anthropocene. Let's briefly talk about, let's see where are we, now the next one. Briefly talk about some of these corrective measures. Renaturing, again, the name Richard Louv comes up, L-O-U-V, that's all you need to know. If you look him up, one thing you'll find, and I encourage you to explore, is his Child and Nature Network. 
Communities across the country are responding to the alarming loss of contact between their children and nature. And just having a name for the disease has helped immensely. So you, you can look up nature dis, de, deficit disorder and find out an incredible number of resources to deal with it. You can also understand as we get back outdoors and reconnect with nature, that increases the sharpness of our sense of place and brings about what I call relocalizing. Relocalizing simply means bringing the human story back to the ground where our stories are told. And for my mind, successful relocalizing means sharpening our sense of place, which is not a fuzzy, abstract, romantic term. Sense of place is an intentional, nurtured allegiance to our here and now. And let me bring this into focus with two quick quotations. If there is a patron saint of relocalizing, it's Wendell Berry, who said we can't know who we are if we don't know where we are. We should be able to say where we're from, don't you think? Not where we get our mail, not to give our coordinates as we move quickly across the surface of Google Earth, but where we've made a conscious choice to grow our lives, where is home? Wendell Berry also said, what I stand on is what I stand for. If there is homeland security, to be had, it may be in this, that we take some piece of our identity from our who-ness, from the where of our lives. Wallace Stegner said, place is not place until it has found its poet. And what that says is that places grow when stories are told from them and about them. And I would add to Mr. Stegner's words that place is not place until it has found its writer, its photographer, its painter, its uh, potter, its farmer, its teacher, all of us can be embedded placemakers by the work that we do that celebrates the uniqueness of the way we make music, make dance, grow food, grow families, grow children, and live locally and connect within our communities. Now, where all of this, everything I've said should lead, is to a new value system a lens looking forward that lets us see ourselves woven alive into this incredible tapestry called life on earth. You and I are and always have been a living part of that fabric of the natural order of things, though we have often forgotten it. I have good news for our planet in the hospital. Rehab is possible. It starts today. A personal ecology, that's a term I use to imagine an essential nutrient we might have, at our, uh, have available against the illness of broken relationships left over by our fading former enchantment under the old story. A personal ecological way of thinking fosters a renewed sense of place and a revitalized understanding of each individual's place in nature. It could be an earth-aware ethical framework that we might instill in our children from birth. With this reborn identity, with self in nature and place, our children's well-being will grow from a bond between their who and a where they can say they are from. And at last, they and all of us down here on the good earth will truly know the nature of this place. Thank you.